I just want to invest in people that really want to be the best that they can be. Hello, everyone. This is Todd Screema and my good friend, Chris Cobbs. We're doing a, uh, a, a podcast on building an unbelievable team culture. And I think this is one of those subjects. I know for me, growing up in business, when people talked about culture, I thought it was one of those buzz terms that would kind of go away. Uh, I didn't really understand what it was. I didn't understand um, uh, what to do about it. And so let me fast forward now. And now I think a great way to describe culture is, let's say that you came to my house for dinner, which Chris Cobbs just did last week. And uh, you would see, you would get to know my dog. You would see how I treat my children. You would see my eating habits. You would see how cleanly my house was. Um, how you felt in my house is the culture. Was I welcoming? Um, was I cordial? Did I give your spouse respect? You know, all these little things that make up this buzzword we call culture. So uh, let me introduce Chris Cobbs. Uh, he, ru he runs a branch in uh, a, a very successful business in Chico, California, which is in Northern California. Um, what's the population there, Cobbs? Maybe 80,000 people or so? Uh, we're up to about 125,000. Okay, so it's big metropolis. Um, and so he's, a, he's what I call a big fish in a small town. I'll let him share with you his market share, but his market share in his market is un, un, unheard of. It really is. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but I want to give him a lot of credibility because of the 100 plus locations that we run across the country, I would say that Chris runs the best overall culture um, within the branch, meaning that his retention rate, his development of his people, how people feel working there, you know, it's never perfect. And I'm sure Chris will talk about that. It's not perfect for me either, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't work on it. So Chris, my, my question to you is, um, as we go through this, oh, by the way, something else I should tell you about Chris is um, his trajectory or his, um, his, his ability to grow his business. I don't know what the percentages is per year, but it's super strong. Like uh, it's probably, you know, a growth rate of 25% a year or something like that over a sustained number of years. Chris, how long have we been working together total? Uh, it'll be 10 years this year. Okay. So I've seen this development over 10 years. And to me, I, yes, he's very good operationally. He's very good at sales. But I think the obvious standout to me is the culture that he's built. And so I guess my first question is, Cobbs, how do you describe culture? I kind of use my house as an example, but do you have a different way of explaining it? Uh, well, I mean, you really explained it as vibe, right? Um, I think the really tricky thing about culture is it, it can, it's a tricky word. It can be used six different ways. Um, you know, you can take it and you can involve mission statements and the direction of, of your operation or your, or your organization, and you can take it all the way down to, you know, simple one-on-one -on -one interactions that support it. So it's, when I think about culture, uh, to, to really define it, it's, it's, is everyone in that organization flowing the same direction from, from, you know, five to six different arenas, right? Are we focused on the same, you know, higher goals, customer goals, uh, the goals for each other, career goals? Uh, I, you know, I think we kind of put it in a box sometimes around, are we having fun at work, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, that's, if your culture is, is, is good, if you're promoting the correct culture, you are having fun at work. You don't, you know, people don't have those, those anxieties on Sunday night when they're, going to show up Monday morning. And that's a huge, huge piece of it. But that's, that's not just what culture is, right? So I, I think it gets, it gets narrowed, depending on perspective. But it, it's a, it's a very, very big thing to try to get your arms around. And it affects, I feel everything we do from from how much we sell to how to, to how we treat clients to our performance to um, our P&Ls, um, I think it's top to bottom, the most important thing that we do. And probably that means it's the most neglected. 
you know, I, you made me think of some, <clears throat> so I, I don't hide the fact that I've had a therapist for five years and I had this one lady, uh, she, she actually was in her eighties and she ended up passing away uh, after I had seen her for about three and a half years. Uh, but uh, Pat was her name and she was a lovely person. And uh, we worked uh, a lot, we're, I'm working on personal life stuff. And I said, Pat, what is love? And she said, Todd, at the end of the day, love is how you feel in someone's presence. And I thought it was so profound. And how you're describing culture and how I describe it, it's kind of that feeling that you have at work. Um, do you respect yeah. your leadership? Do you know what to do? Do you know what success looks like? Are you and that I like I like a feeling because that feeling comes from a hundred different things that you're doing, right? Does does your does your leadership feel authentic? Uh, do you have transparency with your coworkers? Um, you know, I could go on and on, but all of those things come together to create that feeling, um, which becomes your culture. Yeah. So so how did you? Like Chris and I were talking before the, the, just before this, and I said, you know, my biggest concern is that people will watch something like this and they will try and do some of the activities. However, they won't do it authentically, meaning that uh, it will feel contrived or people won't think that it's, uh, that, that you're, you're doing it because it's, you, you, you know, your coach told you to do it or you watched a podcast. There was a, some sort of shift, and I've never asked you this question, but there was some sort of shift that happened with you, and, and to me, I think it's before Summit, because I don't think, I don't, I think you were, I, I felt you this way prior to working with you. Where did that come from? I mean, can, do you have, was there a moment or was there a company you worked for or something like that that helped create that? I don't, I, I don't know what I figured out or if it's something I figured out and it's, and it's kind of related to self-deprecation, right? That and and ego I, I, I and i think when you talk about are, are people going to try to run with some certain things we talk about i think it's more about running away from some certain traits that they have i i you know i feel like a lot of people i know in this business that are in my position are afraid to not be the best of the people they lead and i think when you let go of that and you're okay being I mean, I think the, the greatest leader is, is probably the leader because they're the worst at everything else. And they're going to let people be the best in those arenas and, and do that authentically, right? You can't just say that because you read it in a Lencioni book. Um, and that's when you start collaborating. And I think when people really feel like, hey, Chris comes to me for, for real answers instead of, instead of, you know, he doesn't have the fear of I need to portray I need Todd to think I'm the best at all of these little things that, that happen in my office. I don't. I mean, the only thing I really need to do is, is hopefully make the best decisions. It's all I have to do. And I think if you base a majority of those decisions on what your organization or what your group or what your team, how they feel and their expertise, that's, I think that's the biggest piece of it. I think, I think people think that, that, hey, the Chico branch is so much fun. They have a cool culture. They are like family. They really are. And they really do hang out a lot. They do all these things. And you can't even start those things without a foundation of mutual respect. And I think that comes from not, from being a, a leader who manages what they know and what they're doing. And I think a long time ago, somebody told me, actually one of the first guys that hired me in the business said, if I just hire, if everyone I hire is smarter and better than me, I'm going to do really good. Yeah. And I've always remembered that um, and always tried to do that. I'm going to ask you in a second to just pop off <clears throat> without any particular order and just say, hey, here's some things that I do uh, or have done or do on a regular basis that I think helps build culture. And it may be um, something I know one day I, I was I was calling you during the pandemic and I said, hey, what are you doing? You said, I'm delivering meals to every one of my workers because they're working from home. And instead of you postmating them, which could easily be done for a lower cost, you were personally delivering those meals. Um, that, so it could be something that specific or it could be, hey, here's, here's how I get feedback or here's how I run a meeting. So I'm just gonna ask you to pop off on, on that for a minute. Um, 
you know, b- before we do that, th- there is something that I think is at the heart of all this. And, and it's something that Chris and I believe strongly in. And, and I actually think that most great business leaders have this, this thought process. It's very common amongst the top performers. And that is, uh, it, it occurred to me one day as I was reading that the, the Southwest Airlines CEO wrote a book years ago. And he said his entire culture shifted when he decided to treat the employees as the primary client instead of the person in the seat, the, the, the person flying in the seats. He, and he said, you know, I ran the company that way for years. And then I, we, we just 180 it. And I decided, and his logic was, and, and this really struck me uh, in what was a big turning point for me is that, you know, when you really look at uh, someone like myself or Chris or, or anyone listening to this, we don't do much. Like if you're overseeing 50 people, you're one of 50 people. So you're doing one fiftieth the work logically. So it has to be done by other people. The, the mechanic that owns a mechanic shop that's listening to this and you have five employees, yeah, you're the owner, but you're only doing one fifth the work. So if the employee feels really good about working there, that's gonna show in their work quality. It's gonna show in their customer service level. It's going to show in them doing plus one percent for people that are working, uh, the, the clients that they're serving. So that's kind of the the crux of all this is understanding we're not that important anymore, and that's kind of what Chris was saying earlier. So, Chris, with that said, what are some things that you do? Again, no particular order that you're like, hey, this this really builds culture. Uh, you know. It's such a fun, you know, I think it's probably better off that I don't know that it builds culture in a weird way. And I know that's a weird response because then it's, then it's authentic, but um, my door is always open. I think that's, and I'm always so taken aback when I hear, uh, you know, a salesperson or, or anyone say, oh, you know, my boss comes in at nine and closes the door and, you know, has an open hour from one to two and this and that. It's just, the only time my door closes is if, is, is if it's a private HR sensitive um, conversation. But besides that, it, it's always open. So the door uh, closes, people know, oh, oh, something big's going down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I, people need to know they can just walk in at any time. And I know that takes up a lot. You know, hey, you got a second? Uh, that's a lot. But that's, the, but that's the, the job, right? And if you're not doing that, you're not in touch with everybody. Um, at the end of every single review or conversation uh, with a team member, um, it's what are we not doing enough for you? What do you need? That's the most important. That, that's kind of the reason we're sitting down. Yeah, I, I can tell you how you're doing, how we feel like you're doing. Reality is you know how you're doing. How are we doing? Mm-hmm. You know, what's, what's, what's happening? How, how can we improve? And that's just another part of that collaboration. You, you need to feel heard. I want to feel heard. Um, and and, and I, I don't think you can expect the, 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 the team members around you to not want to be heard. Um, consistency is something else. You know, consistency with um, our, what we call our culture events, right? Every single month we try to have some type of culture event. And it's not always a party, but sometimes it's a con- you know, not really contest, but it's, it's some reason to get together you know, close to the end of the day or, or for the lunch. Sometimes it co- coincides with the holiday, maybe a scavenger hunt downtown, um, try to mix some, some spouse and family in some time or the other. Um, but, you know, even just your meetings being consistent, um, the way you walk around the office, you know, some of this hasn't happened for a year, right, until we get back in the office, but um, a concerted effort. And I, and I let the other leaders and all the salespeople in the office know that the first, don't, please don't walk in the office and, and, and just go straight to your desk. Take a lap. Say hi to everybody. We're small enough. we got 44 people and we got 15 at a, at a different office. So in each office, you have the time to walk around and just if somebody's on the phone, you can give them a, give them a wave. You can tell everybody good morning. Um, I, I, I think it's insane if you don't. So those are some of the, the little tiny things, but I think some of the consistency with that um it is there and then i i think a bigger thing is it's never you know my this my employee my team i don't know i and i think this is something that's not really teachable but it, it's ours i really try to portray just in my verbiage 
that it's us, it's the team, it's 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 our 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 team members. It's not it's not mine. I don't I don't own it. You know, interesting that you bring that up. <clears throat> I tell people sometimes, if you're talking about a mistake you made, use first person. Everything else is we, us, and that's what you just said. I heard a fun some sort of cultural meeting or outing or some fun event once a month. Uh, I assume that is calendared out for you. So, hey, you know, uh, I know one time you invited me up to an event and your uh, golf club was was having a, a dinner party and a live band and, you know, all the employees were there and we were hanging out. And so your family was there. Uh, you invited me. The branch is there. You know, it's like, they're easy things. I think you do a really good job of weaving in fun uh, with work. And uh, just so so the listener knows, uh, Chris is known in our company is if people some, sometimes get a misimpression. Uh, I actually just had someone say this uh, to me a couple of weeks ago. And they said, yeah, I think he just has fun all the time. He does have fun. All yeah. Time. He's ingrained it into his culture to enjoy yourself and to have fun doing it. I don't know why some people think that has to be such a dichotomy, right? It, it doesn't. You can have your cake and you can eat it too. You have to work on it. And, you know, is there a sacrifice? Maybe like, you know, my family and my personal life and, and my work and my business and part of this maybe being in a small market too, it's, it's all together, right? My kids wake up in the morning wearing some t-shirts that I have made, you know, it's just like, it's just our thing and it's what we do. And, uh, you know, we have fun with it and there's no, I, I don't understand, you know, and, and if you work hard and do a great job operationally and, and go out and make the calls and sell loans, what, what in the world is not fun about it? Yeah. I, I think you bring up a good point. There is a, a stigma that there's business is business and personal life is personal life. I think you and I, and a lot of other people blend the two a lot. Um, you know, I was, I took my kids on a, on a boating trip for two nights this this weekend and and a client was there because I love the client and his wife and we had a ball and we spent two full days together you know swimming and jet skiing and doing all that fun stuff some people may think that's weird it's not I don't think it's weird at all to you I think it's normal I mean I've it's, been at your house where you've had a party and I'm constantly talking to me like oh yeah well I'm Chris's friend oh yeah and I've done five loans with him oh I'm a realtor and I send loans to him um, it's, it's almost like it's no difference to you. Like, Hey, they're good people. I like having good people in my life. And yes, we do business together and they're good people. Well, and you have to let go of the bad ones, right? I, I mean, there's, it's, it's the whole good, bad and the ugly conversation, which is a different conversation, but it's what I kind of, I tell my people a little bit. It's like, if, if, if it doesn't work between you, if they're not, the, the right kind of person, if they're not a really good person, if you're not going to enjoy them and they're not going to enjoy you, call the next guy, mm -hmm. call the next guy. Because if, if there, there's no, there's enough fish in the sea that you don't have to hate the people you work with. Uh, you don't have to hate working here. Um, you know, when we've had very, we have very low attrition uh, when somebody leaves, but you know, some people think I'm going to freak out and say, like, well, why are you leaving? If you're going to do something better, that's more fulfilling. I will help you. I will help you do it. Um, it's just like mistakes. You know, we had a we had a VA funding fee mistake, and it was an expensive mistake for the day. And you know, it, it, oh, first reaction usually from the processing team was a lot of tears. And I, I'm always tempted to pretend for a second that I'm so upset, <laughs> but I, it, it's like, hey, I I expect actually more of these than we have. What happens when you do this? You're never, it's never going to happen again because you're so upset about it. I'm actually, you know, I'm actually really engaged and happy is not the right word, but um, proud that you have so much feeling and passion about the mistake you made because it means you care. Yeah. So that's just, I don't know. I guess I, and, you know, some people will watch this or listen to this and say, oh, what you, you know, there's no, there's no hammer to, the, to him. There's no, you know, he's a pushover. And it's like, no, there's, there's not. It's, it's people, you know, the business isn't, you know, 1003s. The business isn't realtors. The business isn't, you know, upper management. The business is just people mm -hmm. in every single aspect. And 
you know, no, nobody, nobody has it figured out yet. Nobody probably ever will have it figured out. Everybody's doing the best they can. Every now and again, when you find somebody that, that, that's not or doesn't want to, you need to help them find a different direction. And I think that's about, that about sums it up for me. Let me go, <clears throat> let me stay on this tactic thing. So you guys know when, when, when I started this podcast, that the whole goal was to give back to business people. And then my personal podcast is about giving back to anyone that wants it. Um, and just sharing some of these ideas. I think we're uh, a learning-based organization. I'm a learning-based person. I believe that life is great. And I believe it's our job to tackle that and have fun with it. Chris does an excellent, outstanding job with that. Um, let's stick on these tactics for a second. I'm going to share my screen. You can always find these, uh, these handouts on beyourbestseries.com. Um, I got a couple things on here. Um, show people you care. So this is more tactics. Three handwritten thank you notes per week to an employee. Uh, I do 10 and I mail them to their house. So uh, I put three on here because most people run smaller organizations, but there's nothing like uh, getting a, a personal heartfelt note from uh, your leader that uh, you can share with your kids and your spouse. Uh, you know, a lot of times I see people and I'll go to their homes and they will be tacked up somewhere in their home. Uh, and it may be a, 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 a card that I sent someone five years ago. So these things have some big effects. Um, Chris already said number two, once per month group outing. Uh, start every meeting by asking about their personal lives. Uh, I think that's a, you know, I'm not talking about 20 minutes here in a 30 minute meeting. This might be five minutes, uh, might be three minutes, but it shows that you care. Hey, what'd you do this weekend? What, what's some fun that you had? Um, I know for me to get a little more specific, uh, I have uh, a number, I get a call list every week um, of what I call my VIPs. And I end up calling 25 of them a week just to say hi and hey what's going on similar to chris's walk around if you're not doing that that's a home run uh you know you're running a a, a business you can walk around for five minutes and say hi and spread the love it's kind of like when chris says that um you know people say if you come home and your spouse is not in a good mood you it takes you about 30 seconds to realize that you know something's off and you can feel it well, people at work are the same way. If, if you come in and you're scowling a little bit and you go straight to your office and shut the door, it's not going to feel good. They're like, oh, what's wrong with him today? Or what's wrong with her today? Something's out of whack. Now I'm in fear. And that's not the culture we want, right? So those are some specifics around that. I want to go through this progression on the bottom. Um, and it's just uh, a evolution of culture to me. Uh, one is I'm just a number. Um, I, uh, Chris does a lot of interviews. I do a lot of interviews every week, uh, and have for 28 years. And I would say the most common comment is something around, I'm just a number. And sometimes they say, uh, my boss doesn't seem to be engaged with me. A lot of times they say, I haven't seen or spoken to my boss in months or years. Uh, that's common. So, uh, that's what that kind of means. Um, number two, you like them. So there's a, um, uh, the second part, they like you. So uh, you have to put your best foot forward. You know, a lot of times I've had an employee uh, and, you know, they're maybe not my kind of person, but then I invest in them a little bit, getting to know them. And I'm always like, wow, I really like them. Um, and there's a, there's a feeling there. Chris, you ever had that experience where you like, hire someone yet? Um, who is, um, uh, I don't know her very well, but you, the real character in your office, um, gosh, what's her name? She's total riot. Tor Tori? Oh, yeah. Tor Tori? I mean, just this kind of crazy girl. And when I first met her, I was like, wow, she's kind of out there. I spent like 10 minutes with her and I'm like, no wonder everyone loves her. Like, it's just, she's just such a cool person. Um, and that... Every time I would say that happens, maybe 99 out of 100 times, I may get some kind of feeling. But once I invest in the relationship even a little bit, I, my opinion has changed. Have you had that? I've been wrong a lot. I used to kind of pride myself on the gut with people. And I, now I'm very open to changing that opinion 
in the first 90 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are people. Um, mm -hmm. I was my my just off topic. I was talking to my father yesterday, and he says, you know, uh, he served in the Marines, and he said, you know, I wouldn't make a good Marine anymore. And and my dad's eighty two, and I said, why is that, Dad? He says, just because I think people are people. Like I couldn't go to war. I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't imagine it. Um, and I think that for those of us that travel a bit, and you get to some other countries or some other states or whatever. You find out people are people, whether you're in Italy or you're in your own backyard, people are people. We all have feelings. Um, the engagement, so so the, the, the next level is the employee feels engaged. So like, hey, I like this company. I could see myself working here for a long time. And then the highest level is they love the company and they really want to serve the company at the highest level. Um, and that's kind of uh, how I view the progression. Now, when you talk about what gets overwhelming for leaders, sometimes you're like, Todd, you're asking me to do all these things. I'm already so busy. And my comeback is yes, but think of the three interviews you did this week to replace that person who left because they weren't engaged and you didn't invest in them. That would have saved you six hours. So these things don't typically take a lot of time, a few phone calls a week, a few handwritten thank you cards, going to an event once a month, um, you know, things like that. These are little things that they're not big, huge, gigantic things, but the, the, the payoffs are, are enormous. They're enormous. So um, Cobbs, back to you, when, when you think about this, um, talk a little bit about the interview process, because I think this is something that may be on people's minds. So how do you know someone fits the culture? That's a tough well, I've made I've made mistakes. So um, let me speak carefully. Um, you don't always know, but there's an energy. Um, and it's and it usually I, I think the most important part of any interview are the questions they ask of me not the questions I ask of them. And that's really where I'm kind of making my deciding factor. Um, you know, if it's only about compensation, we've got some issues. If it's only about benefits, we might have some issues. I, I need a well-rounded candidate that wants a great career, but also wants to be part of something bigger. Um, and a lot of people at this point come in and say, I've heard this is the best, this is the best place in town to work. Um, so that, that keys in some things already, um, but too much, I think too much detail, and maybe this is because I'm this way a little bit. If someone's getting too detailed in their questions about the position that I don't feel like they're thinking big enough, they're not looking up and wanting more. So I, I tend to get a little bit distracted when it's detail questions, because I want, I want them to come in seeing a vision because even if their vision isn't perfect or correct of what they're coming in to do, I like that they're thinking big. It just means to me they're passionate and passion is part of the whole play of, you know, authenticity and, and just folds into this thing that we call culture. Yeah, I, I, I like the hard uh, question. Yeah, a couple of things that, that Chris said that I got was he's looking for positive energy, like an aura about them, which I know aura is a, a weird word, but I believe it. Um, my my uh, oldest son, uh, when he was little, we were walk, walking down the mall one day and he's about four years old. And he says, daddy, that person's black. And the person wasn't black. Said, that person's purple. Third time, he says, that person's red. And I set him down and I said, what are you talking about? He says, it's just a feeling I get. This is a four-year-old. So I did some research and they call them indigo children. And they, they're they very perceptive with their feelings. And as he's grown up now to be 17, he's like that. He'll I'll bring someone over to the house and I'll purposely ask him after he spent a couple hours with him, what did you think of that new person you met? You know, my friend or whatever. And he will tell me. And it, sometimes I know the person really well and I'm like, whoa, he's dead on. So what Chris is talking about is tapping into your inner aura for lack of a, a, a of a better term. We all have those feelings. Just some of us pay attention to them and some of us don't. So you're looking for that, that feeling that you get, um, realize that they're on stage and they wanna get a job so that they can feed their family most of the time. So 
you know, they're trying to be their best. Um, couple, yeah. couple, let's let's do a couple questions. I, I have got a couple interview questions. I love to try and discover some of this. One is, tell me specifically where you want to be in five years. What does this journey look like to you? And then I shut up. Uh, another one, and this is my favorite one of all. You got to be careful. There are HR laws around all this. I believe this is a legal one. Hopefully, because I use it all the time. Um, I'll be like, hey, tell me a little bit about your family life and how you grew up. What was mom and dad like? And then I'll, I'll volunteer and I'll say, well, you know, my parents divorced when I was two. I grew up on a farm on one side of the family. On the other side of the family, my dad was an entrepreneur. And so I thought he was rich. And I grew up in these two different households. And then I went to college. And I just give them a little two minute overview to, to model for them how I want them to answer. Um, and the insight I want them to give me. And then I shut up. And um, um, if, if someone sits there and says, well, um, it was pretty good. My upbringing was pretty good. And they use that high pitch voice. I, I'll just now, because I know better, I'll just look at them and say, what's wrong? What happened? And just shut up. And they'll go, they will go there with you if you make it a safe place. Um, those are two questions that I love. How do you try and size up that person? Are they gonna fit the culture and really digging deep with them? What's a couple questions you might use? Uh, I love digging into the resume, one by one, line by line on past experience. And I love to listen to what they say about past management and past companies they work for and why they left. Um, that's a big, big deal. Uh, uh, you know, there's even, you could, in my opinion, there's, there, there should be no negative negativity there, uh, towards past. Well, they wouldn't let me, whenever I start hearing that, we're probably not going to be a culture fit. Even if you were trapped, even if it was a bad situation, uh, you know, you probably left for better opportunities elsewhere. And that's a, that's a way, that's just a, Kind of tells me are you are you a half full person or a half empty person and that we don't have a lot of time really for half empty people um if you have a problem bring a solution and there's always a way to fix everything and that's that's just the culture yeah i think what what i call that is listening for the blame yeah people either take responsibility proactively or they blame it's one of the two that's always the case i'm yeah i'd much rather hear i was terrible at that I yeah. went and tried to do this job, but I went and everybody was great. They were cool. And I, I, man, I was, I was bad at it. I just didn't get it. I'd be like, I love you. You're great. Right. <laughs> well, self-aware, it speaks to self-awareness, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally, totally agree. Um, let's, I, I've got this little test. So in, in my company, we do a culture test every six months. Um, but this is a quick test um, that we can dive into for, for a minute about um, what this might look like. Again, uh, there's five questions here. These are just things that I made up to ask yourself as a, as a leader or as a business owner. Uh, I truly love my employees like my family. Yes or no? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, Chris would say yes. Um, I, I want to be careful of this. People get stuck on this one and they say, well, my, like my family? Um, yeah. I mean, that's a metaphor I would use. Now, some of us don't treat our family members very well, so maybe it, it, it can be a, it can be a cousin, Todd. It can be a cousin, doesn't it? Can be you know your wife. Uh, I have we have a a, a a fund in our company where if an employee falls on hard times, then we we grant them money, um, and it's called the Ben Barker Fund. People are like, why did you do that? I'm like, because I want to take care of my own. Right. I, I, if I'm going to give money to charity, um, there's a lot of people, you know, anyone can fall on hard times. And most people don't have a war chest of money that they can just tap into. And I'll tell you, Chris, we've been doing that for probably seven, eight years. Sometimes it's six hundred dollars for an electricity bill. You know that, that their electricity got turned off and they're a single mom with three kids. I mean, it's we're not talking about, um, you know, Sometimes it's bigger, like burial costs um, of a loved one, things like that. But you know, it, those are that—that that would be the kind of things that, if you thought that way, you would create some things like that. Um, the employee is more important than anyone else. So, what what you would want to read into that for some of you is the employee is actually more important than the consumer you're serving. That's how I think of that. 
And so uh, I know years ago, someone called in to my team and it was a, was a client we worked with often. And uh, he just berated someone on my team, berated them. So I called him and said, hey, I heard this just happen a couple hours ago. Uh, I said, is this true? And I described the situation as it was described to me. He says, yeah, pretty much 100%. I said, but what things, what, what makes you think that you can treat my employee that way? And would you speak to me that way? And because there's a, there's a right way to handle things in a wrong way. And those are the kind of things that you would do if we thought the employee was more important than the consumer. And it's, and it's not commonly taught. Like this is not one of those things that you read much in books, but to me, it's a, it's a defining moment. Um, would you rehire hundred percent of your employees? Good question. Right. Uh, I know I've had several times in my career where I've, I've asked myself this question. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't, a, if I wasn't hundred percent on rehiring them, I made it a point to set up a meeting and talk to them about how I feel. So Chris, any comments on those? Uh, on number two, I would say that also really goes for, uh, team members, right? Um, my teammate is more important than anyone else, right? Because I, I, you know, you sometimes get the loan officer, you know, either throwing the processor under the bus or always consistently, you know, taking the side of their agent over what their processor needs. And you just have to remember at the end of the day, we're going to be, we're still going to be here. Yeah. And that client's not going to be here. And we're, you know, if we're doing it the right way, we're not really trying to make it harder for each other. We're just trying to get the job done. Mm -hmm. I love this next one. Um, I understand 60% of my waking hours are at work. I honestly think at the heart of Chris's culture building is this concept. So the concept is if you look at uh, working eight or nine hours a day, your commute time, time that you spend at home checking emails, time at home, maybe you take that business call or thinking about work, it's well over 60% for most of us of our waking hours, can't count sleep. So if you compare that to how much time we spend, say with our friends or with our children or with our spouse, all those numbers are around 10, 15%, much lower. And so from a sheer math standpoint, I think that how this translates to someone like Chris is, I want to have fun at work because I spend most of my time doing that. And now that's super simple. However, if you don't do the math, until I, let me say that differently. I did this math about 15 years ago. It changed my life. Because I'm like, who do I want to work with? You know, when I'm, when I'm recruiting someone or I'm uh, hiring someone, this is someone I'm going to spend 60% of my time with. This is important to me. It's a big deal. And it makes me put more emphasis on who I work with, having transparent conversations, for example, if I don't think I, th I would rehire them today, I want to have that conversation. I want to get those feelings out. I don't want to be, um, say, upset at a friend of mine and never telling them why I'm upset. I don't think that's fair, and I don't think it creates relationship. It creates a divide. So um, the last one, people often rave about the culture that, that I have created or we have created. That's a big one. So um, I know I have a lot of people, Chris mentioned this earlier. I've had a lot of people tell me, I don't know what you guys are doing over there, uh, I, but I, 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 I need to figure this out. Like I, I, I wanna be into something like that. Uh, there's a little rating scale on here. It says five is a great culture, four is mediocre and three is poor. Take the ones that, that uh, of that simple five question test, if it, take the no's, turn them into yeses, right? That, that would be the idea that you would do with, with a tactical plan like this. I always say this in, in, in life. There, uh, there are, th life is an action, not a feeling. So we're talking about culture. Well, that's a feeling, but it comes from the actions that we do and don't do. Um, we didn't mention this, but I think it's important. Something as simple as having a birthday program uh, and an anniversary program. So for, I, I have 90 VIPs on my list. And when it's there, I had an um, employee of mine that was his 24 year anniversary. I called him yesterday and I'm like, hey, 
I, you know, and I'm very gracious. And I'm like, I remember when we started, we reminisce a little bit, you know, it was maybe a 10 minute phone call, but those little things are important or receiving a, a little gift and, and a, a phone call on someone's birthday. Th those are, um, those are not big things to do that make a big impression because it's action oriented. Um, something as small as sending a small gift. Usually a lot of times I'll send books out and I'll say, Hey, that this is quickly becoming one of my favorite books I ever read. I wanted to send it to you. It's a ten dollar book, but it makes an impression. You know how many people really take the time to do that? I had an employee a couple of weeks ago send me. I, I was in our branch and we were just talking about we're, we're both um, like to read books, and I like fiction and nonfiction. She said she sent me a note with two books that said, "Todd, great talking to you at the at the branch the other day." We're, we're talking about a five minute conversation. And she said, these are my top two favorite books I've ever read in my life. I hope you enjoy them. What will I do for her now, Cubs? Anything. I mean, over, she sent me $20 worth of books. I called her. I said, her name's Lauren. I said, Lauren, I can't believe you sent me those books. That is so awesome. Uh, I know you're getting ready to go on maternity leave. I hope you have a happy, healthy baby. You got to send me some pictures. You know, it like developed this relationship where where before I didn't really I knew her and she's a valuable piece to the to the organization but I didn't now I know her a little bit more and she went out of her way to do something special for me for twenty dollars matter of fact they were used books just so you know <laughs> which meant even more to me like I think she probably took them off her shelf and sent me her books right so that those are cool things Chris, what's someone, what's something that someone's done for you that made a real impression? Wow. Um, there's a, there's a lot. Um, you know, I, I don't want to single out a single thing, but I, I think the biggest impression, and I can use this last year as a good example, um, because I think it builds trust, is that so many people were, were working from home. There's the, the initial scarcity viewpoint thinks, how much is everybody really working, right? And it, it, you know, and it was a cultural change. It was different. And when you start having those kind of thoughts, um, you start lacking trust. Right. And I think everything we've talked about today has to do with finding the right people and being able to trust them. So, you know, we got this year we had installed. I, I didn't even know for several months. And I find out, hey, we have this productivity software that can tell you really how much people are clicking and pointing and using their keyboard. And, you know, that's about all I can say about it, because I didn't get very far in. I, I, I looked at it and it, it just qualified more of the trust factor that you know, 99% of the time, people are gonna do the right thing. Um, and, and trust is all of it. Nobody in my office has to say, hey, I have a doctor's appointment, I'll be back in an hour. Go, right? If, if you have a team and you, you're working with a loan officer, yeah, I'm sure you're gonna let that person, let her know that, hey, I'll be, you know, I'll be right back. But you don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell the office manager. Um, people, tend to always try to do the right thing. And the more you trust them, they're going to try even more to keep that trust. So anytime you go the opposite direction is when you're digging that hole. So I, I don't know why I thought of that with your question, what somebody's done for you, but I, I think about what everybody, you know, I have 44 people and they, you know, especially this last year, but all the time they work their butt off. Um, and they, they, they're not interwoven. Their families, because of some of their positions, don't get to interweave their family and their friends and their clients into their job as much as some, some of the rest of us do, including me. So um, to, to see what they do and to ever really doubt that, I mean, you don't need to doubt it because yeah, are you gonna get burned and somebody's gonna be off not doing their job, but it's so, it's so infinitesimal in the scheme of things that I, I wouldn't even think to worry about it. You know, so, so what I'm getting from you, and I, <clears throat> I want to say this because I think it's important. Um, are you a high trust individual or not? Uh, Chris is a high trust individual. Um, there are people, matter of fact, I, have, I had a friend recently, and I told him, I said, but you're just not a trusting person. And I said, it's going to be hard to go through life 
that way. And will you get burned sometimes? Yeah, but you'll get burned anyway, whether you're a trusting person or not. I'm not saying be blind and be dumb, but there's a certain amount, there's a certain level of trust that comes when you're a leader, when you're, when you're overseeing people. And um, yes, there's a point where it can be too much trust, but, um, but for the most part, I find that people don't trust enough. You know, you're talking about the pandemic and all of a sudden in a year, we have tons of companies saying, yeah, you can either work from the office or home. But, but prior to the pandemic, no way. Yeah. No way. I Most think they learned a lot about trust, right? Yes. 90% of corporate managers, this is a total guess. I bet you 90% of corporate managers would have said no way. Hey, we want uh, to give our, our employees the option to work from home. As long as they keep up their output and their metrics, you know, they can, they can stay that way. No way. No way. Because we lose control. But is that the right trusting attitude? I think people are going to find that there is a nice balance um, to being able to do that. I remember uh, at this meeting that Chris was at a week ago, we were at together with 10 other people. Someone brought up the idea um, when we're having dinner of having a, uh, that anyone could earn a four day work week. And just watching the conversation that happened, because I, I felt that way for years, um, just watching that conversation and some people were like, no way could never work. And there was the other half of the room that's like, look at, we just went through a pandemic and thought no one would, could work from home and it worked out great, you know, and, and doesn't mean you don't have to keep tabs on it and, and be smart about it. But, but starting with the idea of trust that if I'm going to work a four day work week and I'm, I'm going to have a buddy, Chris is my buddy. That's going to cover, I'm going to cover his desk on Monday. He's going to cover my desk on Friday. If we want the four day work week, we're going to work out those details with some help. We're going to work out those details and I'm going to make sure Chris doesn't fail on Mondays. He's going to make sure I don't fail on Fridays. Why? Because we enjoy having three days off in a row. Yeah. Well, the risk, the risk of not being high trust uh, is going to create more loss than, than the little bit of loss that you're going to negotiate by being high trust. 100%. Chris, if I were to ask you, um, I don't know if you have a culture statement or, or, or something like that. Is there something that you regularly talk about or that's on your business plan or is up on your walls that say, hey, this is, this is, a, this is a, a description of our culture. Do you have something like that or do you just act that way? No, we don't have something like that. Um, it's kind of a, we're, we're really kind of a golden rule place. Um, you know, I know we're talking a lot about humility and, and trust in these things. I don't want I don't want people to think that we don't, we aren't high, highly competitive uh, because that's also a big piece of our culture. Um, you know, one of our mantras is protect the letter and that's just a pre-approval letter thing. And it's been that way for 11 years. And we don't just say it around the salespeople. We say it around the, the processors and this and that because it all, you know, what, say what we do, do what we say is really what protect the letter means to us. So that's probably the closest thing to a statement that you could ask any of all 44 people, what protect the letter means. And that's, and that, and that's what that's about. And I think, I think it means different things to different, to different people, right? Our processor, this, they just kill it. Protecting the letter means protecting them, right? And making sure that, that we're, we're setting up our clients to succeed so that they can do a great job for their clients. Um, but that's probably the biggest one of that. Otherwise, from just a pure culture statement, um, I don't know. We don't, not, not trying to box that in too much. It's more how you act, you know, that not to get off on a tangent. I was talking to someone yesterday and, uh, he said, you're, he had met my kids for several hours and he's all, your kids are really good kids. And I'm of course, I'm flattered and honored. And I said, yeah. And we got in this discussion on how people do that. And I said, you know, I think 80% is them watching you. So if you don't want your kids to cuss, don't cuss. If you don't want them to smoke cigarettes, don't smoke cigarettes. If you don't want them to be mean to people, don't let them see you be mean to people. And, um, and we got in this discussion. I think culture is like that. Like, I think you have developed this culture because as long as I've worked with you and seen you, I don't see you, I see you get stern with people. I've seen you be very direct and open. I've seen you be very humble. What I don't see 
is things that 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 diminish trust, which is hey, someone's leaving your company and you're just going to berate them out the door and you're not going to pay them and you're going to talk bad about them in the community and these kind of malicious things that I see people do. And all it does is make you look like a schmuck. And it, it doesn't look- It doesn't help anything. I don't, the, the only time, you know, we had a loan officer leave a few years ago for, to, to, to open a competitive, you know, shop in town. And that's, that's really the only time I, you know, I'm not, that cordial, but you know, I, I gave that person a big hug and I said, I, I wish you the best. And if you need anything, call me. Now, as soon as they're gone, I'm big, I might, I'll be really transparent. Yeah, I hope you don't call me for any help <laughs> because I have these people to do this. But at the end of the day, if you did, I'm here. And creating enemies doesn't, I mean, I'm very competitive with the competition and my group knows that um that, that's a big part of our drive i i want to grind them into the ground um i have a nine-year-old daughter who drove by a i forgot i said something to her about a new company opening in town and we drove by and and since then a year later they still had a billboard up but they had closed down and uh at the time she was probably seven and she'd heard me say something to, to my wife and jess and she said daddy are those those guys you ran out of town I said, I was so happy. <laughs> I said, darn right, babe. We ran those guys out of town, but they're going to come work for us. They're going to be great. So um, part of that, part of that trust, this transparency, humility, all of that, you got to have a big dash of, of, of competitiveness in there. And that really just sucks, sucks it in um, to really make the thing go. Yeah. Healthy competition. Let, let's end with this. Uh, and I'll go first. Biggest cultural mistake you ever made. Ooh. So this is an easy one for me. I've made tons, just so you know, tons and tons. Um, I've got so many dumb stories that I've done. Uh, but I think I think the biggest was I, I put someone in a leadership position who, who treated people horribly. And by far, hands down, that was number one. Like, I, I, I knew he was doing it and I let it happen. And that was no doubt in my brain. I have tons of small things. That was the biggest thing that I did. So if you're in this position of, and you really want to build your culture, you just can't let that happen. Um, I also think I gained a lot of brownie points and respect when I ended that relationship uh, f- to the right people, right? The people that were more, I just don't think that there's a there's a need to mistreat people and constantly use fear and embarrassment and stuff like that to control people and get them, get action out of them. Uh, I, I do agree. It's a tactic. Uh, I have used it in a coaching situation, not with employees, but a coaching situation. And I'll say things like, Hey, if we don't get busy, you don't have enough savings. You're going to be out of the business in three months. And it's more of a factual statement used combined with fear. So I do use all kinds of tactics, but in general, I try and stay true to my value system. And you said the golden rule. If there's one thing that my dad preached, it was that gold, treat people how you want to be treated. And he always did act that way. Um, I remember my father <clears throat> lost $500,000 in a business deal. And although it wasn't necessarily his fault, he paid back every dime of that 500000 and when I asked him, about it, I said, dad, you don't have to legally do that. He said, I know son, but I did it. And it took me seven years, but I paid every penny back with interest. That's the right thing. So you can sleep at night, know that you're a good person. Okay, Cobbs, your turn. Biggest cultural mistake. Or a uh, big mistake. Super similar to yours. Um, so I, when I look back at it now, it, it's, it wasn't a mistake. I had uh, a very high level operations person who, you know, you know, a lot of times in this business, people graduate and promote because they were the only one there at the moment or, you I've know, they, I have uh, no idea what you're talking about. Right. right? Sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes you promote to your needs just based on, based on skill sets, not based on, you know, is that person going to be a quality manager? Um, and I let it go probably a year too long um just how people were being treated and belittled and 
you know, there, there's nothing worse than asking somebody a question and, you know, being shoved off and belittled. Even, I mean, I'm just asking a question about a loan. It's just a loan. Um, so it's funny when you, you talk about therapy, I was, uh, I was working with, a, what would he call himself? A, he was a business coach at the time. And it started talking about it. And I said, you know, this guy doesn't know my industry that much, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to dive into this for an hour. And it took 15 minutes. And he says, you have to change that. Even if it's, even if it's letting her go, even if she's going to quit, if she's demoted, then do it. And uh, I, just, I remember asking him, how do you know that that quick? He says, you don't want to do it because it's so hard, but I can just tell in your words and your demeanor that you already know it's the right thing to do. And we made that change pretty abruptly. And it was actually a huge, even, you know, the reason I wasn't doing it is, is because it was a huge shock to our system. And it was even a shock that reverberated. I mean, everyone was shocked. Um, at the same time, you know, every single person knew it was the right thing to do. Um, but it's just it's probably one of the hardest, you know, business things I, I've, I've done in the past 10 years, especially at the size that we were. Um, and, you know, now we have the right person in and it's just, it's tremendous, the difference that it makes. So, yeah, you know, just talking about <clears throat> respect level, <clears throat> I remember Chris and I talking about that decision years ago and, um, easy for me to say, you know, uh, I believe my advice was, yeah, you need to make a change. It, it doesn't yeah. fit your culture. Um, with that said, once he made that, I got off the phone. I'm like, I'm not sure if he'll actually do it. And a week or two later, it was done. And HR had given me a heads up. And my respect level grew for you during that time. Because I that was a big decision. And I was like, but what happens with that? And I, I, want, you, I want the listeners to understand this. That action reverberates through the organization. And I guarantee you, whether it was decisions I've made or the example that Chris is using, people after the shock and awe wears off two or three days later, they're like, whoa, we stand for something here. This is, there, there's, a, there's a certain cadence or, or a behavior style or a way of treating each other that is okay. And, and, there's, and there's ways that are not. And that's a, that's, you gain so much respect when you make those tough decisions. I guarantee you, probably 50% of the people listening to this that run a business or own a business, you have that person in your organization right now. And that person, the problem with that, when you talk about culture, um, that person, well, I, call them, I call them cancers. And I know that's a harsh word, but the reason I call them cancers is because people attach to them and if you know anything about cancer cells, they bond together and grow bigger. And so <clears throat> you, you have one person in your organization of 30, for example, that's a cancer. And it happens like this. I'm at the copier and uh, Chris walks away and I say just a little something demeaning to someone next to me waiting for the copier as well. Like, gosh, did you, did you see his, his loafers? Can he get a better pair of shoes? could be something that small. And then, but I'm doing that five times a day to, to the 30 people around me. And people are starting to buy into it. And pretty soon they're like, yeah, what's wrong with this person? Gosh, they're, you know, what's wrong with that employee or, you know, this cattiness that happens in the workplace. And if you allow it, it will happen. If you allow that cancer, cancer to grow, it will grow. It will grow. So, so. Chris, let's do some parting words and then we're out of here. Um, what would you say to the small to medium-sized business owner that wants to increase their culture? If you said, hey, do this one thing, what would that be? And it may be something you already said. I'd, I'd say just, just start it one person at a time, right? Get some help with it. Uh, get an understanding of what you want that culture to be and be honest about it. I think number one, and you can, I, I think you can be honest about it with, with everyone on your staff. Hey, we're going to change the culture here. Here's, here's where, where we think it is. And here's where we're going. Help me get there because I want you guys to enjoy this as much as anyone on the staff. You know, if you tell them your true intentions, I mean, you're not going to change the culture 
Are we doing it to make more money? I don't, I don't think so. When you start thinking about culture, I mean, you're, you're doing it to, I mean, in the end, be a more successful business, but it's not directly tied to, to monetization. So um, I think that's what I'd recommend. Let people know your intentions and ask for their help. Yeah, I totally agree with that. <clears throat> yeah, what Chris is saying is define your, make a statement you're going to change the culture and then define what that is. What I would say, and this would be either one or two, depending on your situation, find the cancer and cut it out. Yeah. I think there's tons of businesses. They know who's caddy around the office. They tolerate it all the time. The leader tolerates it and they don't do anything about it. And what you're doing by doing that is making a statement that it's okay. It's okay to treat people bad. It's okay to be catty. It's okay to uh, cuss at people. It's okay to do that. And that's not okay. If that's, there's no culture that's going to be su successful doing that. It's and maybe, and maybe I'd add just a little beer pong on Fridays. Yes. Beer pong on Fridays. Let's do that. <laughs> hey, Chris, you are great. I'm sure you helped a ton of people. I really admire you as a business person and how much you care about people and it's real. And I wanted to say that one more time. It's a real thing. We really have to care about people as more than we care about the customer. we got to care about the employees and all the the, the flock that we oversee and shepherd them correctly. And that's, that's a, a, a metaphor that I think really resonates to, to make yourself the king of culture and really live it that way. Or if you don't have that skills, maybe you appoint that person and you give them full control over that section of the business if that's just not your skill set. Okay, so oh, it, takes, it takes a group of the leadership and it needs, you know, when you have leadership meetings, it's gotta be a bullet point on that agenda um because no one leader is going to do it by themselves 100 percent, chris thank you very much but i really appreciate the time you're awesome thanks todd thanks for listening guys don't forget uh share this with somebody right share it with so, so, someone has culture problems you're like hey i heard you talking about this watch this podcast and don't forget we do home loans for a living all over the nation so if someone sent you this or you want to get a hold of someone contact us we, we are happy to help you with your home loan that's purchasing homes or, or refinancing homes, all the above we do. Thank you guys. And thanks again, Chris. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening. Bye guys. Thank you. I just want to invest in people that really want to be the best that they can be.